Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Subhub Podcast. I'm MK Sullivan. And I'm Danny Moreno. And today we have a super fun-ish filled <laughs> episode uh, with a lot of topics because, yeah, we're going to cover the last couple weeks, not only in trail running, but also just running in general. Yeah. And it's been a while since you and I have uh, chatted because we took a week off and then I interviewed Rick by myself. And so it's like, it's nice to just sit down with Danny again. And just go over all the things, even though we text about it like every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, don't worry, guys. We still talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. And just creating like a sustainable schedule for us as we go throughout the year and things start ramping up as we already feel they are. I know. Yeah. Last year we got a little bit carried away maybe, but it was our first year. So <laughs> we learned some stuff. We won't have episodes coming out every single week like we did last time. Um, plus more with Sears and all in the Golden Trail World Series final. But yeah, uh, we're learning. We're learning. We're learning. Um, so the first topic we are going to cover is Black Canyon's 100K. Holy moly, this was a crazy event. I was at the event last year and I thought that was already pretty big or bigger than it had been in years past. But then being there again this year, dang, like Era Viper and Jamil are just doing a bunch of things right. It's awesome to watch that event grow. Yeah, they are crushing it with the live stream. Um, I think you were saying earlier that they may have been one of the like first events that really kind of did this. And, um, it's just, it's cool that they, they bring in so many different people as well to like commentate and stuff. And it just keeps it really interesting because these are really long events. Yeah, definitely. It's really cool to have like the different perspectives. And I think if I remember correctly, the first live stream may have been pre COVID or around that time around 2020. And I felt so bad because some people were giving them a hard time, but I don't know, even know if Starlink existed at that point. Yeah. But it was like, at least they're trying to make this work. And you could just tell that they're learning constantly. I mean, they even did the live stream for Mammoth Trail Fest uh, end of last year. Uh, they're, they just announced that they're going to be at the Big Alta and Gorge Waterfalls uh, in April. And so, yeah, just good on their team for getting it done and learning and, and continuing to grow on that aspect. Yeah. And uh, I didn't watch the live stream, but you were saying that because it was the world trail majors that they did something a little extra this time too. Yeah. They had people from um, other parts of the world. So I believe it was China and Canada. Those were the the two areas that I heard for sure there was a representative because with the world trail majors, they are trying to kind of like broadcast and highlight each of those races to the other regions of the world that have a race. So for example, with China, they have the Hong Kong 100, uh, Canada, they have Quebec Mega Trail. And I just thought that was really smart. I, I, I mean, we've seen it with Golden Trail. Like every time there's a, a major announcement with Golden Trail, you see articles in Spanish and French and Italian and just like in English and, and just all over the world to really get that word around. Um, and so I don't know why I didn't expect it, just maybe giving them the grace like it's their first year, they're figuring stuff out. But yeah, that was really impressive to to see, which was really cool. Yeah, that is really cool. And Black Canyon was all or was special this year because it was a golden ticket race like it always is. But this year it had three tickets, um, which is pretty unusual, meaning that it also rolled down through sixth place instead of the normal fifth place. Um, if there was somebody in the top three that had already had a ticket or did not want one. Um, and I don't know about you, but I was fully surprised that the top three was all no ticket people, like people who didn't already have tickets or something like that on both sides, men and women. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was also the fact that with the golden tickets, they were paying for them for their entries too. So it's not only the race with the most golden tickets, but your entrance into Western States, which is like $500, which that's a, a lot of that's money. A lot of money. Um, <laughs> especially if you don't have a sponsor. For? Yeah. Especially if you don't have a sponsor, but I mean, <laughs> the sport delivered in a really cool way. Like it does. It's always fun to have people that maybe you didn't expect because um, you know, each 
Hayden was a strong favorite on the men's side, and he ended up taking the win in a course record of 730, which that, I mean, it's just wild to think that he ran that fast, especially yeah. watching him in the later parts of the race where he still looked like he was cruising, but he did not have any breathing room even through the last aid station because, yeah, we were both there. You saw Jupiter uh, Carrera Casas, who was from Mexico, purely from what I've read and heard is like, was here to get a golden ticket. He was right behind him and looked just as good. Like, and Chris was right behind him. And Chris was right behind him. And there was still other men like uh, Stephen Kirsch, Eric LaPuma, Trace and Knopp, like who were all coming in and no one's form was really breaking down. It was Hayden was, had his foot on the pedal the entire time, which yeah. was just mind blowing to me. And competition like that obviously brings out like course record type day and the conditions yeah so coming from somebody who spent the whole last six weeks heat training for that race and then spent <laughs> the five days prior to the race just shivering uh, <laughs> covered in rain and snow it was a perfect day for fast running so perfect I mean besides the first part of the course which was a little bit sloppy like the rest getting just enough moisture to like pack down some, some parts of the trail because I know it's pretty rocky and stuff just top-notch conditions um and then on the women's side rachel drake was a favorite as well uh she ended up running 847 which was a couple minutes off the course record um she's de- someone i definitely like cried for watching her finish and then um becca windell was second a name i did not know uh and immediately didn't even put in my top 10 on fi- on the not Final Fantasy, uh, Free Chill <laughs> Fantasy. I'm such a nerd lately. I've been going deep in anime and shit. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. No reason to cuss. Uh, <laughs> back anime down. is exciting. <laughs> it's very exciting. Back going down 8.52. So also sub nine, which last year there was a huge deal made out of the fact that Keely and Heather were both sub nine. Um, and then Lauren Puretz, 9.06. And because of another name I didn't know, because of the delayed start, these women were finishing in the dark. Yes. Oh my gosh. So the, I feel like we're going to be all over the place with our like (laughs) recap of this, but yeah. So the race was originally supposed to start at 7 AM. I think pretty much all of us woke up, ate our food, got ready to go. And then saw on Instagram that it was going to be delayed two hours because it snowed in spring Valley, which is where the race starts. Um, And then so two hours later, we all show up to the start line for a 9 AM start and we've all slammed our last gel getting ready to go. And they're like, I'm so sorry, you guys, but we actually need 30 more minutes. So this race had a two and a half hour delay, um, meaning that the top women, yeah, ended up finishing in the dark, which I'm sure was nobody's plan. Like I'm Rachel told me, she was like, I didn't bring a headlamp. I was like, me either. Fortunately, my (laughs) pacer has three. (laughs) Was that Helen? Yeah. (laughs) She's like, this isn't my first rodeo. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So I did learn if you're going to run an ultra, just pack everything. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, yeah I two mean, and a half hours. When we Tabor Eli Tabor and Eli Hemming were with me at the half Mesa or Mesa Marathon, as soon as we saw your start delay, one, we were like, yes, we don't have to rush over there. But two, how many people don't have headlamps that are for sure going to be in the dark for not one, not two, maybe three hours, like the yeah. whole second half of the race, who didn't even think to bring a headlamp? Yeah, I would have never thought that I knew yeah that. the original time that I had planned to finish was like 3 45 yeah sun so goes down wow. at six <laughs> and also like you know maybe you hit the middle of the day where it's hot but depending on how long you're going to be out there those temperatures can drop quick in the desert and yeah. so it's also just how you dress and layering so that was a fun <laughs> added last twist. minute I mean you know that was great call by them they wanted to make it safe because from what I heard it was like icy in the start which that can easily injure people from slipping and falling on something wrong I ate shit in the first 400 (laughs) meters before we ever left the high school I slipped on some ice and I was gone (laughs) yeah yeah it's uh so what a turn of events for that race um and just so many inspirational performances um through and through uh, people having breakthrough days, people coming out of nowhere, people, Craig Hunt, his Dude, finish Craig Hunt had the most impressive finish of the whole day. I thought 
he came into the last aid station. I'm pretty sure he said something like, I'm cramping. Like, I need something. And he and was in, like, 10th place. He was in 10th. Some, it may even further than that. Yeah. And it was kind of one of those things where you're like, damn, he might have, have a, a rough day. Yeah, he might have a rough last 10 miles. And this dude turns it on and ends runs. Up fourth. Ends up fourth and runs, like, 606 average or something like that, if I remember correctly, watching, like, the splits. Yeah. And his last like four miles he was running like six lows and then broke six yeah it was absurd so yeah, he, he don't give from, up like, until it's over <laughs> seriously he went from like 10th or 11th place to fourth place just missing a golden ticket by three minutes uh which and that I next mean, group of dudes was not that close to the top three when we saw them at the last aid station yeah it was insane uh, he closed hard kirsch closed hard um Eric Trace and closed hard. Trace and closed hard. Eric Lapuma, like those guys were fighting until the finish. And you could just tell too, because as you were watching the finish and they were coming in, people, I believe maybe the who was oh Chris Myers was fine. But then after that, it was like Craig and then who was after Craig? Steven and then Trayson. Yeah. All of them, as they were cresting the hill, sorry, I'm going to get to the point. All of them were looking back because yeah. like all these moves had somehow been made where they're just rolling sixes, um, which is absurd to me on what is the most technical part of the trail, mm -hmm. you know, having already been out there for seven plus hours and they're all looking over their shoulder. So like as a, a viewer and spectator, it was just so exciting you're like, oh my gosh, they are literally, you know, for ultra running, sprinting. Yeah. To the finish. <laughs> it was absurd. Um, and also eight guys under eight hours. I can't remember if Finn Melanson's projection was 20 or 10 guys under eight hours. I'd have to like listen back to the preview. But I remember when he said that, having had been there last year, I was like, no way, no yeah. way, no way. I was like, it'd be like <laughs> five guys were under eight hours, but eight guys. And then ninth and 10th were at 803, like barely missed it. 803. It's yeah. absurd. That's so fast. And Stephen Kirsch improved wild. his time by 30 minutes. 30 minutes. <laughs> That's it's, crazy. Yeah. It's wild. And he, I think he also got fifth or sixth last year. It's just the sport's so mm -hmm. cool yeah and like then that. at least on the women's yeah side, and the men's race was all over the place the entire day the entire day yeah you could never count anyone out yeah it was just constant and yeah. then the women's race just like my takeaway is just women being women and racing smart and just you know people making their way up throughout the day um I wasn't I didn't have my eye on, on Becca Wendell all day but I probably wouldn't have projected she was going to break nine hours if I was um, yeah. just like working I loved, her way up. Yeah. I loved Heather Jackson's post the next day because Heather Jackson went out hard as Heather does and like died a great death, but you know, still finished. And she posted on Instagram the next day. She was like, oops, I didn't realize that the 60 K was Sunday and not Saturday. And I loved that. That's really funny. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's nice when somebody can poke fun at their themselves. Yeah. But, it's um, just running. You it's know? just running. Yeah. But also like mad respect. She knows what her strength was. And she was like, I'm just going to go ham this first 60 K and try and hold on. I mean, it worked yeah. last year. She got second. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But, then, um, I oh, guess sorry. we got to talk about the elephant in the room too. At some point. Yeah. I was just going to say one last thing is with the women coming in, I saw constant tears. Of, oh, like there was crying with the men, but the women, especially, I think also just because there was a lot of surprises. So I have to imagine that some of these women's, it was like their best day that they've ever yeah. had. But um, I was crying during a handful of these finishes and I was walking from somewhere and Katie Asmith saw me. And she just kind of briefly asked me, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm coming over here. And then Katie Asmith, being the mom that she is, she's very sweet. She came up, she's like, are you okay? And I said, it's just these people, they're finishing and it's just so inspiring. And they were out there all day. And then the time changed. She's like, I get it. Like ultra running. I was like, yeah, it's just. 
crazy. <laughs> I was just crying on stuff. Um, but yes, I, love it. I do want to transition to the elephant in the room. Well, it's not really the elephant in the room no. because it is a name that I personally am very sad isn't on the result list. Um, but MK, let's talk about the day. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was a, a weird day for sure. Like with the, the start change and stuff, but I feel like in a sub ultra situation because it's already like so nerve wracking. I don't know. I never really felt nervous about this race. I don't know if it was because it was like, I'm going to be out there for like nine hours. Like what's the point of being nervous? But, um, yeah, like when I saw that the start was changed, I was like, no, okay. I guess I'll just eat second breakfast. Like I'll just give another shot. And then it was like, oh man, should I eat third breakfast? (laughs) But, um, got to the start line. Uh, like I said, I did like fall pretty hard leaving the high school, but that was just like a slipped, fell, scuffed up my knee, kept going, caught up with the women again. Um, and yeah, the first 10 miles or so were really, really muddy. And it was like, I was prepared because I had run the course a couple of days before I was prepared for like sticky mud, kind of like we have here in Reno. If there are any Renoites listening, um, the kind of mud that just like sticks to your shoes and feels like it weighs 20 pounds each. Um, but it ended up being a lot sloppier than that, which I was like, whatever, fine. This is actually better. Cause then it's not sticking to my shoes. But it was really hard to see because there was some snow, some mud, lots of rocks. And at like mile three, I was behind somebody else on a single track and just like stepped wrong and like sunk into the mud and stepped on a rock and rolled my ankle pretty bad. And I remember like yelling, ouch, that hurt. (laughs) And I'm sure the people around me were like, what? (laughs) But then I I just kept going because I mean, sometimes you roll your ankle and like it's fine. You just have to like kind of run out of it or whatever. And so I did that and it wasn't getting better. And so I got to the first aid station, which was at like mile seven and a half or something. And I was like, so it's like an hour, an hour. Yeah. About an hour. I was like, I am not feeling great. Like my ankle is really starting to hurt because we were still in the mud. And so like by protecting my outer ankle, I was then rolling my inner ankle and like also, you know, just other weird stuff that you do when you're compensating. And so I told myself, like, even though maybe it was a little bit of delusion, because I feel like by, by an hour, like I should have known that, um, it wasn't going to warm up. I was like, maybe once we get out of the mud, like it'll be fine. So I didn't want to like count myself out, even though I had the feeling I was going to have to drop out by by like mile 10, I was like, I'm probably going to have to drop out of this race, but I was like, not going to give myself the chance to just like back off until I got to my first crude aid station. I was like, I'm going to race through Bumblebee, which is basically mile 20. Um, and then if it's not better by then I I, like, I'm going to stop. And so I was feeling good because the rest of my body felt really good. Like there was nothing I didn't feel like I was pressing, like we were in a groove, like Rachel and I were chatting. Um, Sarah Beal was there as well. And um, I think at mile 15 or 16, I finally, I couldn't tell who was behind me. And I asked who was behind me and it was Sarah. And I said, hey, so just so you know, I'm going to drop out at this aid station, like at mile 20. And she was like, what? (laughs) I was like, yeah, my ankle like hurts. And I'm getting to the point where I'm like tiptoeing uphill because I can't dorsiflex anymore. And my shin is like in a lot of pain. And she was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry or whatever. I was like, it's fine. I've been (laughs) talking to myself for seven miles or nine miles now. Like I've come to terms with the fact that I have to stop, but like, let me know what you guys need. Like I will pull you guys into this aid station, you know? And she was like, that's really great because I'm getting really tired. And I was like, okay, cool. So then Rachel comes up a little bit later because she had kind of like fallen back from us at a previous aid station. And I told, I told her, or Sarah may have told her like, Hey, MK is dropping out. Like, but she's going to pull us this aid station. And Rachel just screams at me. She's like, no, you can't. (laughs) I was like, I'm really sorry, but like, I have to. And, um, so yeah, I rolled into the Bumblebee aid station. My crew was really confused because I was smiling and, um, you know, like looked pretty fine. And I was just like, I'm done. Like, I'm sorry, you guys, but I have to be done. And they were like, are you sure, you know, being a good, good crew, like just like double, triple, quadruple checking that I wasn't just like tired or like having a bad mental day. I was like, no, really my shin feels like it's going to break in half. I need to stop now. And 
Um, that felt good. That felt a lot. Well, it didn't feel good to drop out of the race, but like when I dropped out of OCC, it was like, I was sobbing, you know, before I even got to the point where I had to stop. Like I was so upset because I couldn't pinpoint what exactly was wrong. I just like, couldn't do what I needed to do. Like, it was like, maybe I'm sick. Maybe my body is fatigued. Like, I don't know what it was, but I couldn't pick out exactly what it was. And so therefore I didn't want to like stop. Whereas this at least was like, okay, I rolled my ankle. If I stop now, I can run another race. Like I can maybe do something different. If I push to the end, like maybe if this was a 50K, I'd be fine. If I run 100K on this ankle, more than likely I'm not going to make it to the end because I'm going to roll my ankle one or two more times. Um, and I've been in that situation before. And that is like, a, like doing that with my ankle, I'll be out for two or three months. So it's like, I just, it felt good to listen to my body in a way that was productive. And um, I also knew that I had to make the decision before I got to the aid station, because as soon as I heard the aid station, I was feeling so good that I was like, oh, maybe I could just keep going. Cause the aid station was like, the vibes were so high. And I was like, Ooh, I'm feeling these vibes. Like I'm going to keep running. And then I was like, no, you have to stop. <laughs> so yeah, didn't have the day that I wanted, obviously. Um, but shit happens. You can't control the conditions and like that mud just got me and uh but it was it was cool to like be in that pack of women because it was like so encouraging everybody was like there we were chatting because it wasn't like a 50k where we're all going <laughs> like as hard as we can from the beginning it was like we have to do this for 62 miles um so yeah I um I actually am feeling good about it I was telling Danny offline that like when we had our OCC rundown it was just like the two of us crying for a really long time <laughs> And this was like, I cried a little bit because I really wanted to finish, but I'm not like looking back on it. Like, well, what could have been, you know, it's like, well, I rolled my ankle and I can't really do anything about that. So yeah. now I'm just trying to figure out what's next. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which that's been very fun yeah. talking to you about. Yeah. I think that's a really good piece of advice to tell people and share with people too, that if something happens during the race that is physically potentially very damaging, like if it isn't mental or maybe you're feeling a little tired to to start with a little groggy. Um, I've had some of those races and they end up being some of my best races just by, yeah. you know, keep, keep going. Um, but if it is something physical, like make the decision before you get to the next checkpoint and hold yourself accountable to actually follow through with that decision because as you said you know it's so hard when people are cheering for you yeah okay you look great even though you know in internally you're like well I've been compensating for the last 40 minutes and even yeah. though I look great it doesn't feel great um and I know what it's supposed to feel like when I'm efficient and so I'm just really proud of you too for just making that decision beforehand and not leaving it into the hands of you know, getting to Tommy and Helen being like, why aren't you still going? You're like, well, maybe I should go. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's like, I I had a moment yesterday where I was like kind of frustrated with myself because my ankle doesn't hurt. And I was like, ah, like maybe I could have kept going. But then I was like, no, MK, this was literally the point of you stopping. Like the point was that like, maybe you could take a week to like recover from this instead of like taking out your whole spring. Like you don't want that. <laughs> No, 100%. This is why you did it. And also, yeah. even if your ankle feels fine physically, it is swollen. So, yeah, it is. There so was, swollen. there was, <laughs> it's physically showing signs that it was, it, it had some sort of minor trauma or trauma that happened in the ankle roll. So, yep. Now the fun is where, what MK is going to do next. But first, she has to let that ankle heal up. Yep. Yep. Do I stick to my original plan or do I change my entire story? Or does she do Western States? No, 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 no I'm kidding. <laughs> ah, no, no, man. I'm kidding, <laughs> kidding, kidding. <laughs> yeah, just in case you guys didn't know, I'm actually on the wait list. <laughs> Never run 100K in my life. That's why I wasn't going to accept the ticket because I'm already on the wait list. <laughs> like, gotcha. gotcha. Um, yeah, and... But you raced this weekend too. I did. I was going to say one last thing, though. It was so cool to have um, 
Corinne, Leah, and Katie Asmith. There was a couple other females. Just having kind of like that equal coverage of, you know, male announcers versus female yeah. announcers. I thought Air Viper did a really good job of that. So just know For it's sure. appreciated. Um, yes, I also raced this weekend. I raced the Mesa Half Marathon with Tabor Hemming. And fun fact, Eli Hemming drove us around everywhere the day before our race and the morning of our race. And then he still went and crushed the 60K <laughs> course record the next day. Um, I just thought that was very, very selfless. And he, I kept saying, I'm like, you know, we could figure something out. And he's like, no, it's easy. I can just do it. Um, but our race very similarly ended up having a delayed start. Same thing. We were, except I guess the only difference is that we were literally on the start line, you know, all the runners leaning forward about to start their watches. And then this woman at 630, which is the race start, the, my watch then became 631. And I'm notoriously not the most on time person, but I'm on time for race starts. <laughs> and um, she, I was like, 631? Why is this race not starting on time? <laughs> and then this woman walks in front of us with like a yellow vest and says, the race is at 630. And keep in mind that behind the like elite group of runners or the runners that got signed up to be put in that group there are thousands and thousands of runners behind us i think this race had like over three thousand runners and all of those people had already taken off their layers and it was freaking cold it was like 30 something at this point it and was had, so cold <laughs> it was so cold and it had been raining all morning so everyone's like cold and wet everyone had put their stuff in like a Henske truck or something and the truck it's like, how are you going to find your stuff in, in that huge truck within like 30 minutes? Or at this point, it's like 25 minutes. So I really felt for those people, whereas Tabor and, uh, and I had Eli who had our jackets, like we already didn't have our pants and 30 minutes is a lot. Like it is. if you have already, like, if you're already on the start line, it's cold. And if you're expecting to like hit pace right away, 30 minutes is a lot. Cause as you said, MK, you take your gel, you eat, you like do a work back schedule throughout the whole day. And so I had taken my gel like 15 minutes before the start, waiting for it to hit me. That was my only caffeine gel. So I'm like, now I'm out of caffeine. I'm going <laughs> to see what's going to happen. And then Tabor and I start jogging away from the start line to try and stay warm. And at first we said, oh, we'll go out a mile and back a mile. And that'll be about 30 minutes or something. But for some reason, one of us said, you know what, let's just turn around just in case. And so we turn around and we get back to the start line at 620. And no joke, this same lady comes out and says, actually, we're going to start at 625. We're like, <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> you can't say a dime and then take it back because now all these thousands and thousands of people are also jogging, trying to stay warm. And so it was funny because then at this point, everyone in the, at least around us, it could, you could hear they're like, stay strong, stay strong, hashtag, stay strong. Everyone stay strong, stay strong. And so everyone just, you could hear these whispers of people being like, stay strong, stay strong. Like we got this <laughs> because, you know, just starting a road race. And so now we're lined up again. It's about to be 625. So they were going to do 630 now, 625. We're leaning over and then no joke. Right at 625, the inflatable arch deflates in front of us. <laughs> and so it's it's impassable. You can't even start the race. And so now it's like 626 and they're like kicking on the generators trying to like get this arch to <laughs> reinflate. <laughs> and then <laughs> the lady, no joke, it's 627 because I was looking at my watch because I'm just like, we're going to end up starting at 630. Goes in front of everyone, no gun, no nothing. She says, three, two, one, go. And everyone says, looks around, this is a joke, right? And she's like, three, two, one, go. I started the watch and we're like, oh my gosh. And so then it's just, and then we went. Chaos. Chaos, true chaos. And um, yes, that was a rough start. I wouldn't say that was Mesa Half Marathon. Everything else was pretty like damn pristine from the check-in experience, signage, blah, 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 blah. But that start experience wasn't the best or mo I wouldn't say I would say not very considerate of people who paid a lot of money to participate in that race um and yeah so we started I was kind of on pace which I was aiming for like five 
35, 25 pace, feeling good. Um, and then mile six, something really weird happened where like the elite runners, we had a nutrition table and I went and I, the nutrition table was probably like 10 meters away from where we were actually running. And so I started beelining to the table and all of the bottles, marathon and half marathoners weren't spread out. They were just clumped together. And mine was in the middle, like literally in the actual middle. <laughs> and so I tried to NFL that bottle out of there without <laughs> spilling anybody else's. And I do like this weird lateral movement because it was on the part of the road that kind of curved down. And my right leg just like did a weird sh shoot up and it just felt like it went numb. And I thought I was going to drop out right at that point. I was like, just run it out, run it out. It's like trail running. Maybe you're cramping. Hopefully you didn't pull something. Just run it out. And the girl I'd been racing had already kind of pulled away. So I'm like trying to work hard to get her. And I was like, oh my gosh, my leg doesn't work. And it gave me a little PTSD from a 10K. This has happened before where I actually ended up like getting a stress fracture. And so I was like, I hope I'm not going to stress fracture my talus again from this one move. Um, and so after a couple miles, it finally came back and um, I'll get to the point, but was racing this girl back and forth. And this girl was like the craziest serger I've ever raced in my entire life. Like hats off to her. She, no joke, probably surged. 30 times throughout this entire race. It felt like every half mile she was surging, trying to break me. And it almost worked because there were a couple of times where I just immediately thought, there's no way I can cover this. I can't keep, I can't keep this up. I can't keep this up. Whatever is going on, I can't keep this up. And then we hit like this two mile stretch that was uphill. And that's where I slowly started closing the gap. And I was like, all right, maybe I got this. And then I pulled up next to her. She surged like three more times because now we're in the final three miles of the race. And I just told myself to hold on, hold on. And then going into the mile, after thinking about it briefly, she had been surging for about like 10 to 20 seconds each time. So then I told myself, I need to surge, but surge just slightly longer than she's been surging to make her think that she can't go with me. So then I told myself to commit to half a half um, half a mile. So three minutes or so. So yeah. I just pushed as hard as I could. And luckily it ended up working because I didn't have another gear until the last <laughs> 200 meters. But what's cool with road races is you start to sometimes roll into other races that have already happened. So the back of the 10 K people and everyone was going crazy for a battle. They were like, this is the third and fourth woman. Like, <laughs> and then, you know, you hear people cheering like, go, 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 catch her, run away from her, hold her off. And then, you know, the back girl, catch her, catch her, you can reel her in. Um, and so that was really fun having that. Um, and ultimately I finished in third, which was exciting. Sorry. That was a really long recap. <laughs> That's okay. Mine was long too. So like, <laughs> <laughs> let me see. What was my lesson to learn? My lesson was to keep covering moves as yeah. long as like, don't give up on covering the moves until you ultimately cannot cover a move. Just because you, while a person's trying to break you, you also don't know how that can also break a person. If you just keep coming back from the dead, they probably are also probably thinking, oh, this person actually has some energy in them. Yeah, for sure. I'm sure I know I do. I'm sure you also have some experience with like breaking someone in a race and then like two miles later being like oh have I also broken myself yeah exactly <laughs> exactly yeah I feel like I hope that worked because yeah. I got nothing left <laughs> hopefully I have another surge of life because I may have ruined that yeah. for everybody <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly yeah. so cool though I mean Danny still ran, ran very fast she ran like 113 low so thanks I think it was yeah, yeah like 113.03 so barely yeah. missed it that's all right yeah. it's still so fast <laughs> thanks <laughs> I'll do another one in two weeks and so hopefully um I'll have I'll have a pacer for that or some of the race I'll have a pacer um so that'll be a little bit more even splitting but yeah this was this was a good race to remind me that I can race right now which doesn't always happen in your first race where you feel like you have those Gears yeah. or especially not in February. Yeah. So that was good to to happen. Um, yeah, for sure. 
So those were our race recaps. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Never Second. Never Second uses a modular system that allows you to create the exact carbohydrate formula for your need and activity. Their products are meant to be mixed and matched so that you can have 30, 60, 90, or even 120 grams of carbs per hour. As a professional athlete, I was introduced to Never Second about a year ago after a rough race at the Mont Blanc Marathon. I was trying to take in gels that required a lot of water, but without a crew and the fact that there weren't enough aid stations to adequately match my intake, it became quite the struggle of a day. After that experience, I started using Never Second in training because their liquid gels weren't as sticky and required less water and are much easier to get down, making my race day and training nutrition immediately more successful and simple. Their gels also contain 200 milligrams of sodium, which is a real bonus on hot days and especially humid days, if you're me. And if you want to try Never Second, just head to neversecond.com. That's never, N-E-V-E-R number two.com. N-E-V-E-R number two.com. And use code SUBHUB25 for a 25% discount on all of your orders. Now to transition to other news. Um, It's a wild weekend. This was a wild weekend. The first thing, we kind of decided we were going to sandwich the not-so-fun stuff, but topics we feel are very important to discuss um, and to provide maybe if you are interested in our perspective on the first one, I feel has a very singular perspective. And that was the passing of Kelvin Kipton. Uh, Him and his coach were in a car accident. And this is our world marathon record holder. He just set the marathon record in Chicago. He was only 24. Yeah. Yeah. And he also had his sight set on the Rotterdam marathon where he was hoping to break two hours, which his world record is now two hours, 35. So you know, very possible. I don't know about you, but Tommy and I were literally watching like Melrose games because we had like recorded it um, when I saw this news on Instagram. And so we were like really hyped for all these like things that were happening at Melrose. And then I just was like, oh my God, Tommy, Kelvin Kiptoon passed away. Like at first I thought it was, I like wasn't sure it was real, but then I realized that it was Sidious and I was like, oh, this is a real news article. Yeah, no, it is it is the type of news where you kind of are stopped in your tracks for a second and ask yourself, is this actually happening? Um, because yeah, just him and his coach and to and die in world, a car accident. It's yeah. And his so world sad. record was ratified like less than a week ago. So the timing of it is just like so crazy. Yeah. The other another crazy thing somewhat in relation was somebody brought up that Steve Prefontaine also died in a car accident at the age of 24 yeah and just like similar inspirational distance runners for the world um yeah it's just ugh, it it's just really sad I don't know what else to say about it but we just want to make sure that we mentioned that and you know love to to his families and other loved ones that are connected to him because I I'm sure this is not an easy time right now. Yeah, for sure. And in other news, we're going to discuss uh, the recent test result of uh, Stian Engerman, the Norwegian trail mountain athlete who is a two-time world champion and also winner of OCC this year. And this is a really tough topic for us, um, so much so that we actually re a re-recording this section again um just because we've been thinking about it a lot and have a lot of thoughts and yeah it's just hard all around yeah this is just an emotional topic i think being a fellow professional trail athlete um so we did have to like reassess and come back uh but we're gonna give you guys the facts <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, so yeah, Stian Angermoon, uh, posted on Saturday that after OCC, he tested positive for chlorothalidone. I'm probably saying that wrong, but yeah. Um, and I forgot we should preface, we're not doping experts. 
That's yeah. Like we're, we're, we are professional athletes and podcast hosts, not yes. doping experts. And not Sorry. doctors either. And so. not doctors either. So yeah. go on. <laughs> so um, he tested positive after OCC for this uh, banned substance. It is banned because it is a diuretic, diuretic and therefore it is a masking agent. Um, some sports use it to like lose weight. Like if you're a boxer or a wrestler, those weight-based sports. Um, but for like, uh, a sport like ours, it is often used before competition to increase fluid production so that you like are peeing more than you normally would. Um, and therefore covering up anything that you may have been taking. Um, and so this was, like I woke up to this news before my race and so did Danny. Um, and both of us were like, oh my God, I didn't text you about it because I didn't want to talk to you about it before the race. Yeah. But um, yeah, so we don't know what his current ban is, but based on his Instagram posts, like we just know that he definitely won't be competing for the rest of 2024. Um, but he is appealing the decision um, according to his Instagram and an article that he put out. Um, he believes that maybe uh, his his tests were tampered with or, or the, um, fish oil that he was taking may have been, you know, had traces of this substance. Um, so yeah, he is in the process of appealing it, which as we know from like the Shelby Houlihan debacle takes years and years. And a lot of money. Too. Yes. Yeah. And, um, it was found what they do normally in these tests, uh, for those that ha- of us that have been tested is they, I guess this one was the French anti-doping agency, which I can't remember if I've been tested by them, but at least with WADA and USADA, you go to the bathroom, someone watches you pee, and you pee in one cup, and then if you can't keep peeing, you go back to the room, and you keep chugging water, um, and then you can go back and pee, and sometimes they'll, like, you have to hit a certain point on the line, um, And then you have to come back and you state everything that you are taking. So supplements, prescription meds, protein powder, protein powder. I always always list every single possible thing that I'm taking. Um, And then you sign on it and you sign it probably like five to 10 times um, with your signature saying it's yours, et cetera. And then normally what you'll do is you'll close the lid. Um, They have like a, a lock on it and then each urine sample has like an ID number to it. Um, and then you put that in a box and you seal it up. Um, but yeah, in this case, both of his urine samples did have the diuretic. Um, sometimes people with just one urine sample has it like barely or something. Um, so yeah, I guess I just wanted to point that out too. Yeah. But his AMB samples tested positive for this substance. Um, yeah. and I guess the main thing that we wanted to say is, we we need to be respectful of Steon and his family during this time because like he is appealing it, you know, we don't know for sure that this is uh, true. Well, I guess true is not the right word, but we don't know for sure that the positive was right. Like he feels like it's not, he has the right to appeal this decision. Um, but as a trail running community, as the PTRA, like we have been asking for drug testing in this sport for a long time. And we can't start out this kind of new era of like professionalization and doping control by doubting the system um, that we have asked to be put in place um, because it is a guilty until proven innocent thing in this um, space. It's not like being in a court, you know, in the U.S. And so um, we can't just automatically write it off. Um, and start mistrusting the institution that we have asked to come help us. Yeah, definitely. And it's one that we've asked for a lot uh, in PTRA and just other groups and stuff. Um, Yeah, I think personally for me, my pendulum is swinging vigorously and and some days it's right in the middle uh, with just emotion and realism, optimism, pessimism, uh, towards this situation, as you guys know, MK and I have promoted Steon a lot, even just like a couple episodes ago, we're out there fighting, saying he got snubbed in, yeah. the, in the top 10. Um, and yeah, just having had multiple conversations with, conversations with him, 
just like asking for advice and stuff. Um, yeah, just like, I think it's a, it's a crazy challenge. Uh, I feel for him because gosh, like if he, if it is a, a false positive, um, I mean, his life has already changed drastically and it's an athlete's worst nightmare because yeah, the losing the money and stuff like really sucks a lot. Um, especially for him, he just had another baby. I believe this is what he's been doing for just a couple years, but even with like his current band, he can't even coach or be within like the vicinity of the sport. So it's like potentially all his economic ties have just been like shot. Um, but I forgot where I was going with that. Oh, that at the like, same time. <laughs> but but uh, what I was gonna say is that like money is one thing, but I don't know. If, personally, for me, if I ever got a false positive, it's more my reputation and like the spirit of the sport, right? Like we all found this because we loved this sport, and that being tainted is like is truly a nightmare. Would or yeah. at least would be for me. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, because yeah. I think. Um like you you don't, you can't really come back from that fully, like, because there will always be people that even if it does come around that um, he wins this appeal that will be like, well, we still think you were doping. So it's, yeah, I can't imagine. But at the same time, like, I can't imagine being in Francesco Poopy's shoes right now. Like exactly. Yeah. If it is true and in the, it's not a false positive, like that diuretic was in his system. Like there's a chance that Francesco doesn't have a retroactive, um, you know, like bonus in his contract. So he just gets paid for second place, or maybe he was renegotiating and doesn't get like the money that the winner of OCC would get, or even just the moment, right. The moment out there. Um, and so, but I do think that we have to kind of buckle up, um, because, this it this sport is becoming more and more professional and therefore we will continue to get more of these positive tests like yeah especially just, with the sensitizations growing and the, yeah. the money Hold growing on to your hats <laughs> yeah yeah it's just cre- it true i think something else i was thinking about it is just insane that he literally is kind of like the first we've had a there's been other ones and they're those like this year's an all winner last year yeah this year's an all winner last year there's some people that are competing in our sport um who have had bands in other sports and like have continued to to compete in our sport um but yeah it's just like i think it's especially challenging because it's dion angerman i hate to say this but (laughs) if there's there were some other names i'd be like yep that makes sense (laughs) yeah (laughs) i won't say who those names are but But this one hurt this this, one hurt yeah this one hurt for sure. Um, so yeah. yeah, those are our thoughts and things, thoughts yeah. and facts, some facts, yeah. some thoughts. I, yeah. So be patient, be kind, and uh, we'll see what happens going forward. And honestly, this should potentially, I hope this isn't like an, a pessimistic way of looking at this, but um, I want, I want even more testing. Oh yeah. Like, across the board um yeah yeah I definitely want more testing especially after you know it's funny like looking at like a let's run.com thread because you gotta <laughs> like deep dive in there every once in a while it's so funny to me when people are like I just don't understand why trail runners would dope and it's like there's money involved now like yes yeah yeah it, it may not be as much as a road race but like it's the same reason that any other athlete would dope <laughs> totally yeah yeah and it's um if you're like a, a road person with like, if you're a guy who's running 215, 216, you are highly incentivized economically. If you got, if you got the interest in trails and got those other skills, it's like, you probably could make more money on the trails. Yeah. Same with like females running like 235, 233. It's like, yeah. Odds are you could probably pick up some money here and there. So don't think it's all sunshine and rainbows over here in the trail running world. I think that we're, I mean, I don't know that you and I will be surprised as this stuff comes out, but like, I think a lot of people are in for a ride. Yeah, exactly. I know. I uh, keep thinking of Sage and yes. you know people <laughs> being like, there's no, <laughs> there's no drug dope or not drug doping. There's no doping in, in mountain running. It's like, and he's mm. like, yes, there is. And there probably has been Oh uh, yeah, for even without the money, just people, people want to be the best. Exactly. Um, yeah. so yeah, 
be patient, be kind, and we'll we'll keep going forward with this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know. So we sandwiched it. Um we sandwiched go it. We're gonna like reel this back up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's start um, track and field, man. Yeah. Like I said, um, it was a crazy weekend. Like we had Black Canyon's golden ticket. We had like some sad news, but we also had like the Milrose games popped off this weekend. Yeah. They were really exciting. I feel like I'm still catching up on it too. So go yeah. ahead. What were some of your highlights? So Tommy and I were obviously driving back from Arizona. So like we missed it while it was happening. And both of us kept opening our phones and being like, oh my God, no, don't open Instagram. Like we, we got to watch it when we get home. And so before we even like went over to his parents' house for the Super Bowl, we went and watched the Milrose games. It was so good. Josh Kerr breaking the world record in the two mile with Grant Fisher, like hot on his heels um l st pierre less than 12 months after having her child just broke her own american record in the mile and yard nagoose broke the american record and was so close to the world record in the mile it was crazy and Hobbs kessler was like not that far behind him and he's only 20 years old <laughs> like, yeah i see a crazy week of track. and wasn't it alicia monson broke the two mile oh, record yeah alicia monson broke the american record in the two mile and nikki hiltz was like right behind yeah i think alicia. she was three or four seconds back but still like <laughs> yeah it was i think wild. she may have been under the previous record still damn yeah that's wild um yeah i've seen some i've seen some clips of those performances and josh kerr coming down that home like I think he was going into the last lab just yep. looks uh, uh, like a freight train just His kick so, is unreal just so much forward momentum with yeah. power because sometimes with distance runners they're kicking and it's a beautiful stride and stuff but he just had some extra power where you're like oh Pops my the gosh. ground yeah yeah and honestly, like after that performance, Jakob Ingebrigtsen should be shaken in his boots. Yeah, totally. He is coming for him. Like I would um, love to see Josh Kerr do the 1500 5k double at the Olympics. That'd be insane. Has yeah. he done the 5k in the past? I've never seen him run a 5k since college. And I, even then, I don't think he ran the 5k in college. I think he just ran the mile and the eight and then cross country. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. 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 But he's run 10. 10- four I think in the half or maybe even faster maybe 103 so like he's got the strength that's right he did that earlier this year that was yeah. like a big thing that people pointed out and then Ellie St. Pierre by no means does every postpartum mom need to compare herself to the yes. situation but also that's freaking insane like yeah. not even a year out and running watching your her- PR yeah, seriously. Watching her and Rachel Drake this weekend, I was like, moms can do anything. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. And watching, uh, there was like a reel of McKenna uh, Smith from the trials that was going viral. Yes. Oh, of that like her, got me so hyped. <laughs> yeah, of the journey. Uh, it's like have kids and dreams too. Because yep. she had like her third kid, like a maybe a year or less than a year out from the and trials. And she like PR'd by nine minutes or something at the trials, didn't she? um you're like 226 it was it was a lot yeah it was it was something absurd like at least three to five minute pr um not exactly what that is but yeah pretty insane and then elite yeah alicia monson what was her time i don't remember but it was a wild weekend of track i'm so excited that track season is back I'm, i'm sure you are similar but tommy and i are like huge track and field fans and that like time in in space where like there isn't track in the fall is it's rough for us because we watch track every weekend once it starts yeah i got peacock just to watch track this year <laughs> Heck yeah oh alicia monson run ran 909 oh my gosh it's like uh what'd she run 909 Put. so that's like 534 per mile Oh, sorry, yeah. four thirty-four. Yeah, disgusting. I don't even know if I could run one mile or <laughs> barely oh, three laps. Maybe I know laps. I couldn't run four thirty-four. Yeah, maybe actually not even. What is that for a eight hundred? That's a two seventeen. I that's, can't. Even, that's a hard I can't do maybe, that. <laughs> but probably not. Hard maybe, like full out sprinting. Yeah. 
the last hundred meters. Like I'm definitely negative splitting. Like I'm not running that, that first lap is going to be so hard. And then the second lap is just going to be me dying. <laughs> oh, that's so absurd. Yeah. And Nikki Hiltz, they don't normally run the 3k. So that was actually pretty impressive to watch. Yeah. I remembered seeing something that they posted uh, beforehand, just about doing uncomfortable things. And that's, that's going to cool. be really good for their just like Olympic season to have, I feel like when you move up in distance, it just like really mentally helps with those shorter distance races. Especially if the that. two mile is still a friggin' sprint. Yeah. Kind of related. Francesco Pupi wrote, wrote about his half marathon, which I think he also um, said something of the sort, like it's been a hard week, which, yeah. For you guys that don't know, Pupi does a lot for our sport. Like yes. with the talks with UTMB and then now the whole Steon thing, like, if you see that kid, give him a hug because he yeah. is just a force to be reckoned with. Um, thank you, Poopy, for all that you do. Um, but yeah, he ran a half marathon and he was talking something about like how much speed an actual mountain runner has. And it made yeah. me think of, because I ended up commenting on his post too, to the sense of Nikki Hiltz doing the uncomfortable things. I don't think as mountain runners, you need to do road stuff all the time or speed stuff all the time but and i think mk is on the same vein of belief maybe every other year maybe once a year do one road race or just something that's out of your comfort zone maybe a very runnable trail race if yeah. you're normally a very mountainous person just to shake it up and like yeah. you know i i feel that some people don't want to do road races because it's very vulnerable like here's your time sort of thing yeah here's your speed. But I feel that can also be extremely valuable to be, oh, I need to work on this. Oh, I actually need to work on this. Yeah. And I think especially with the direction that the sport is going in in general, like you got to be fast. Yeah. These days. Yeah. You, <laughs> you don't need well to be have some fun and run a race. Yeah. You don't need to be like sub what, um, let's see, like 70 fast in the half marathon. But I do think it helps if you can run under like 120 or something if you want to be competitive for the yeah, front definitely yeah i mean um, you, you me and Tabor have all run 113 now yeah and, uh, but pretty... yeah and we're we're all right we're okay yeah. i think that's a really good road time i honestly oh, that, think, no i think that's a very good road time yeah i think we have our anomalies uh not anomalies just extreme talents like Nikki brinkman and grace and murphy who have both I think Nikki may have broken 70. That's really fast. Yeah, she definitely has. I and Grayson's run 111 or 110. I think she's run 110. 70. Yeah. 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 And I'm sure there's other examples. Um, like I don't know what some other runners have run. But um, there are also runners who where am I trying to go with this? <laughs> who have run closer to like 75, 76, 77, 79, 120. You put them in a mountain race against not Grayson or Nike, but a road runner who could run that fast. Yeah. And they'll beat them. Oh, it's yeah. It's like you just need the right amount of speed. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Speed totally. and some mountain training. That's all you really need. That's it. Just do That's every it. single component of running possible <laughs> and you'll be a good mountain runner. I was talking yeah. to someone about that the other day. They're like, how do you become a good mountain runner? I was like, literally any facet of running you could think about. Do it. Just, just be in the top five of all 10 categories downhill <laughs> running uphill running runnable running uh super technical running you know if it's muddy if it's icy blah blah, blah you should be yeah. in the top 10 of all those and you'll be okay <laughs> it's super yeah. simple it's super simple <laughs> oh man okay yeah um, uh, olympic trials we did miss this by a week but i still but feel like we should chat about it just it was insane it was Kind of like Black Canyons surprises. Oh, the men's race wasn't as surprising. No. Maybe how it unfolded, but the women's race just what the heck? What? <laughs> what happened? And I don't remember if I texted you Fiona O'Keefe at some point. I feel like maybe I did early on. Like, I was ignoring your text messages because you were like two hours ahead of me. And I was like, she's going to give something away. <laughs> yeah. No, this was like before the trials. This was maybe weeks before when we started making our picks. Oh, yeah, and I, I think I maybe only picked her because I'm like, that's kind of fun. She hasn't run a marathon, you know? 
But that was yeah. the only time I ever thought of her. And then I was like, nah, I'm going to go with the favorites. Sarah yeah. Hall, Kira D'Amato, <laughs> Emily yeah. Sitchin. But um, yeah, it just goes to show you got to be ready on the day. And freaking Fiona O'Keefe, what happened? Drops a 509 at like mile, what, 20 something? Yeah. Um, and she literally ran by herself for the entire second half of that race. Yeah. That's like the last hour. <laughs> I would be so terrified, <laughs> but she handled it like a champ and was a champ, ran the fastest American debut in history, and then broke Shirlane Flanagan's trials record in the process. Disgusting. It's disgusting. That's I hope so people good. know that when we say disgusting, it's like- It's a, a good thing. It's a good thing. <laughs> We're just impressed. Yeah. I'm like yeah. so impressed that I'm like mind blown. But, and then second place is Emily Sisson, which is something we like- Honestly, probably most of us picked her to win, I would guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then because she is our American record holder. And then third place, Dakota Lindworm from Minnesota Track Club. Like, what a story. Wow. I what loved story. her story. The yeah. like her P- high school PRs walk on to a D2 or D3 school and then just working her butt off for years. And she's run a lot of freaking marathons. A like, talk about marathons. becoming a master of your trade she just has run them and she learns she runs them and she learns and um I can't remember where I read it but something about when third place started going away from them she had gotten some advice from a previous coach that told her if anyone makes an aggressive move like really aggressive past mile 16 or something like that don't go with them they'll come back and she just stuck to that and then she Pressed reeled it. them in. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if I'd be able to do that. I'd be like, oh, got to go. This is my chance. Yeah. So many shakeouts in that yeah. like final like five to six miles. Yeah. Like, so many people just barreling in from the back. Yeah. And dropouts too. Like Betsy Sania was still there and she was running with like, the third place pack and she just walks off or not walks off, but Obviously, something wrong had happened, but yeah. watching that on the live stream, my brain just exploded. What just happened? Yeah. I remember when I was at the trials in 2020, like a ton of women dropped out because in their head, I mean, kind of same thing, I guess that happened like with me is like, they're like, oh, I'm not going to hurt myself, put myself in a hole now because I'll just come back on the track trials. So it's kind of crazy. You're like, these are the best women in the world. Even if they finished today, they'd still run under two hours and 30 minutes. But they're like, not worth my time. Like, I'm not going to be in the top three. I got to go to track. Oh, my gosh. It's wild. <laughs> 10K is going to be insane. Yeah. There, I mean, there was Sarah Hall, Kiara Diamato, Bessie Sania. Who else dropped out? Did Nell Rojas remember. eventually drop out? Maybe. But, like, that's, like, Sis in, in 2020, she dropped out of the marathon at, like, mile 20. And then she went on to make the 10K team and absolutely dominated that field. That's right. She just had like a lap on everybody in the heat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. People were just like, you can't run that ha- that fast <laughs> in the heat. And she was like, bye. <laughs> Watch me. <laughs> yeah, that was insane. Dang. That was super cool. And then the men's race, also very exciting. I feel really bad because I told myself I would remember the gentleman's name who led 20 miles of the race from Colorado. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, too. the people's hero. But um. Yeah, he, he tw- was determined to get them under that 108.10 so that they could have a third spot. Yeah, 208 was or, the, Yeah, sorry, 208. Yeah, because so it's so weird. This rule is really weird to me, but you unlock spots. It doesn't, like anyone can unlock a spot. So Connor Mance and Clayton Young had both run under 208 yeah. at some point before the Olympic trials. And so they unlocked two spots for American men to send uh, Olympians to Paris. So However, then, if if they didn't place one, two, so, it didn't matter. Yeah. As long as whoever had placed one, two had run under like 111.30, whatever the old standard was. 211.30? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I keep saying one. We were talking about half. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> 11:30. So like they had to have had run under the previous standard, but most of those guys have. And and the craziest part is that a third spot can still be unlocked. Yeah. Like during the until, race. Well, no, up until like April. Oh. 
So there, if a if a guy from the U.S. runs under two o eight, I think it's like London Marathon might be the bat the last chance for it. Then that person doesn't necessarily make the team. Whoever finished third, so um, who finished third? Uh, he used to run for uh, but so the third place guy gets that spot still but somebody else could unlock it for him. It's so confusing. Leonard so, Courier. Yeah, L- Lenny Courier. So say Galen Rupp goes and runs 208 like next month or 207.55 next month, then that unlocks a spot and Lenny gets to go. Wow. Who does Lenny run for? Like which brand? He's Army. Okay. Yeah. Still, he's still Army. Dang, yeah. if I was the American Army, U.S. Army, which... I know you guys have hella money. You should <laughs> pay one of the other runners to go unlock that spot yes, for you. Seriously. That's your best marketing but, ever. If you can you get know, <laughs> I don't know if you listen to the, the post-race interviews though. I loved listening to Lenny's interview because one of the first questions they asked him was like, you obviously don't know that you've, you're like going to the Olympics. Like, how does that feel? What are you going to be thinking about? And he was just so grateful to have finished third because in 2020 he had finished fourth like he was just like I finished third and that's good enough like he was like if I make the team he was like I have no doubts but like I I podiumed and that's what I came here to do and that's enough it was so cool to like listen to him just be grateful for the day even though he may not make the trials at least he wasn't fourth place like he was the year before I love that yeah yeah just being in the moment he did it so and he did that late yes yeah he was not in contention for like a while there yeah yeah there was a lot of carnage and um the BYU boys Connor Mance Clayton Young just training partners friends finishing there was like a point where Connor Mance like went back and high-fived him or something yeah and that gave me chills and then Clayton Young just like slap in hands just like feeling that with a teammate yeah. on the highest level I don't know. It just, for so many people, you finish college and that's kind of like the last of your, even if you're, if you go on to be a professional runner and then there's like some groups here and there, but to get that at the Olympic trials, especially in the uh, marathon, I feel like it's so much less likely that you have a team for like the marathon. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. I was literally at a gas station, like crying, watching (laughs) women finish. (laughs) Well, I wasn't at a gas station, but we had made our way down to Round Valley because I was supposed to do a time trial went terrible, terrible. And because probably when I'm supposed to be warming up, I keep telling my my husband, Mike, no, just wait, just two more minutes. They're going to be done. They're going to be done. Just staring at my screen as I'm crying, you know, watching them finish. And I'm yeah. like, okay, let's go do this time trial and just, you know, died after the first mile but it was just so so emotional watching that um yeah, yeah. that's I so love it. cool um okay what what do we have next as far as racing mk is gonna decide um sorry week, that's hopefully. that was a weird transition that wraps up trail or track and road whatever we've been talking about whatever we've hour. been talking about yeah exactly um MK is going to decide she's been working on it really hard. What she's going to do with all that fitness. A lot of brain work. Yeah. Um, and she's got no ba- bad options. Yeah. No bad options. No bad options. Danny, you're running another half marathon next. When this comes out, it'll be next weekend, I think. Yeah. I'll do Ventura half marathon. Um, right now, I'm like pretty much, this has been a very experimental winter for us super low on the mileage for me compared to past winters and just like trying skate skiing and snowboarding and stuff. Um, But we've been keeping the weekly hours higher or the same as if I was running 80 to 90 miles a week. And so now we're transitioning to get in a couple of long runs before way too cool. So no more speed work really. Like it's kind of like, well, that's what I got. Um, Ventura half marathon will be like the last speed thing of this block, just like a long effort. Um, and then we'll taper and do uh way too cool. So yeah, just the next couple weeks. Um, cool. And uh yeah, I think that's all for today. Yeah, just that. 
I hope you guys enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, like, oh, we have one more announcement. Oh, we have yeah. One more announcement. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> like, um, okay, so we, we still have our newsletter coming out. You may have heard us talking about this in the last episode. If you go to our Instagram, go to where the hyperlink thing is, click on that, or go to our website, www.thesubhubpod.com. Let me triple check that. Okay. We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. Too, if you sub- Google it, you'll find it. Yeah. Um, it's the subhubpodcast.com. Okay. You can find, um, you could sign up there. Um, we haven't said the name, but if you click that link, you'll, you'll get a sneak peek into what the name is going to be. And we are very excited about this. Our first one is going to launch March 1st. So sign up, send it to your friends, et cetera. Um, and yeah, uh, I think that's it now officially. Yeah, I think so too. But you never know with us. We can yeah. keep for like 30 more minutes. No, we're going to cut it off. We promise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, uh, we're like, done. Like, subscribe. This has been the Sub Hub brought to you by Free Joe.